Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Free Thinking Podcast. My name is Scott Olson, here with Dr. Tim Stratton, talking some more metaphysics this week. Tim, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. That last episode, you kind of blew my mind with some things, so I'm <laughs> looking forward to get some uh, clarifying questions your way. So Sounds great, man. Do this thing. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. So, yeah, that last episode uh, was fascinating, really interesting. So there seems to be... Uh, two different kinds of facts that uh, I guess could be said to exist. Right. Um, categorical facts and mm -hmm. dispositional facts. Yes. Now, uh, the way I understand it is ca uh, categorical facts describe the way the world is in actual fact, the way it actually is, right? Right, right. Whereas uh, dispositional facts describe the way the world has the potential to be. Yes. So... Okay, good. So, so how have metaphysicians uh, thought about these dispositional facts? Those are really interesting to me. Yeah, because because the categorical ones they they seem kind of fairly straightforward. It's like okay, take the world at like a snapshot. This is just what it is, and you know, I it, that it's not exactly that straightforward. But definitely the dispositional ones tend to be the the more um, nuanced and interesting ones. So the when you think about the nature of reality, which is really what metaphysics is, a common way of understanding dispositional facts is in terms of cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. So if you take the dispositional fact that the vase is fragile, so that's a pretty common example of what a dispositional fact is. So if you think about it, the vases being fragile, it doesn't really describe the way the world is right now, right? Like the, there's, there's nothing about the vase that you would like, you can't really point to the vase's fragility, mm. right? But we kind of think about it in terms of, okay, what would happen if I threw a rock into the vase? Well, obviously the vase would break, you know, all things being equal, right? So in, in that way, the rock kind of causes the effect of the vase breaking. And that's pretty much what we mean by the vase being fragile. So, there are kind of four categories of views on cause and effect, and they each have to do with what that view considers to be the most fundamental thing in the world. And this will hopefully make more sense once I describe what the views are. So the four views are hypotheticalists, gnomists, powerists, and what has been called uh, neo-humeists. Okay. Mm. So again, like these are kind of like, broad schools of thought where like there's different you know sub theories as you know philosophers are or want to do they'll you know have find their own little flavors but those are kind of broadly speaking the, the categories that most most theories can fit into and so what we have then let's let's start with the hypotheticalists so this one i think molinists could wrap their heads around pretty well because hypotheticalists say okay we can just describe cause and effect at its fundamental level in terms of conditional statements Okay. So let's let's take our vase example again, just to make it make it clear. So, um, the hypotheticalist would say something like, "Okay, the the dispositional fact the vase is fragile is really the same exact thing as saying, if a rock were to hit the vase, it would break." Right. So that that is like the fundamental way to understand the vases being fragile, mm -hmm. right? Well there are seemingly some truth maker worries with this, right? So if you remember truth makers from our first episode, right? The, the worry is, okay, how do we understand how truth makers can exist for state states of affairs that, that don't actually exist, right? Because if we want to say that the, uh, the vase is fragile is the same as if the rock were to hit the vase, it would break. How do we understand that statement? If a rock never actually hits that vase, Mm. Right. Like what what makes that statement true? Um, that seems to be a, a difficult and, you know, interesting question to to consider when you take a hypotheticalist views. Now, certainly hypotheticalists have uh, proposed answers to this. Um, I'm just saying, like, for each of these, I'll kind of give like what the primary issue or the, the difficulty that a lot of these views face. And then, you know, we can assess from there. All right. So so that's kind of the hypotheticalist view. Does that kind of make sense? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that one's pretty uh pretty simple. The next one is the gnomist 
view. So Nomus view is a little bit more tricky, I suppose, because they describe cause and effect in terms of what are what they call laws of nature, right? So a law of nature is just kind of a generalization that says, hey, whenever this one particular situation occurs, then this other situation will occur after that. Okay, so they're just saying that happens and we can generalize what a law of nature is and that describes how we understand cause and effect, right? So the main problem with this view is that there doesn't seem to be anything about the, it doesn't say that there's anything about these objects that relate to each other that would necessitate the laws of nature being what they are. Rather, these laws of nature just are brute facts because the, there's because they because because remember what I'm saying is the laws of nature are fundamental, right? Yeah. Whereas in other views, like there are laws of nature, right? But they're built on top of other things that are more fundamental than uh, than that. So again, the hypotheticalist and the powerist, the neo humanist, they would all have some conception of what a law of nature is. But the law, the gnomists would say, no, but the law of nature, that's that's fundamental. And then from there, we understand everything else. But so are they necessarily naturalists? Not necessarily. And so laws of nature is just kind of a they just uh, I think most would be. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, just because of the 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 way in which that view makes certain it, it would be easier, I suppose, for like a nominalist probably to uh, that would be one of the easier views for a nominalist, which we'll talk about later to okay. hold to as opposed to um, like a realist because um, uh, or I mean, a realist could hold to that, I, I suppose. But like a realist has other views available to them, whereas like a, a nominalist, if you're going to say that there aren't any like things like properties or, or whatever it, i think it kind of limits the the views you have and we can talk okay. about all that in, in a little yeah. bit yeah. but um law of nature i would say i suppose you could abstract that out or make that uh you could say um that there are like i guess i don't even know how you'd exactly talk about cause and effect in terms of non-physical things um uh, just because that's typically thought of as like a physical type of thing. But I suppose you could, yeah. um, what, what would they do with the Cologne that God is the cause, the immaterial supernatural yeah. God is the cause of the material natural. Yeah. Universe? Well, I mean, that's an interesting question for, I think everyone, um, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. but, um, I suppose you could say like, there are other, there are supernatural, causes and effects yeah. or, or something like that so i would say most people that would take a gnomist view would be naturalists but i i, I guess in my mind i don't see necessarily why you would need yeah, to, I'll have to think about that hold that um but anyways we didn't spend a ton of time on hypotheticalism or gnomism like we talked about them but uh um they weren't as uh, primarily focused on because um the uh, more popular views are um, uh, the powerist view and then the neo humanist view. So the powerist view, they would describe cause and effect in terms of the, the powers that different objects possess. So, for example, a rock has the causal power within it to break a vase when going a certain speed. Right. Mm. So so this this is like this is what they mean by like power, like it's got powers to it. Um, and so this view kind of has a difficult problem uh, in accounting for negative causation, right? So what I mean by this is that there seem to be things that are caused in the world when there's like an absence of something, right? So for example, you could say uh, death is caused by lack of oxygen. Well, what is the thing that possesses the power to kill that person? Mm. Is it this thing called a lack that exists? Well, that <laughs> doesn't seem right. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, okay, how do we understand that type of uh, cause and effect relationship? Now, certainly, you know, powerists have responded and said, you know, in 
given you know responses to this type of view but that is probably the most difficult question that um, powers have to answer and then finally we have the neo humiest position which this one is if if i describe it and it does not make sense it's fine like it's hard it took me probably like a month to really <laughs> understand what exactly really? this means but right. it basically says that the most fundamental thing is this qualitative mosaic of things that just exist in the world so it's like all dispositional facts are really just categorical facts strewn across time right and so it's like you just that that's just the most fundamental thing and to impose other things on it are just kind of ways we understand just this kind of qualitative mosaic of things that exist hmm. and so the the advantage of a view like this is that it's very simple right because you're not saying that there are things called powers you're not like saying that there's like reducible or there's not counterfactual statements there's not like you know all these uh like properties anything like that it's just this like there's no interrelation it's just like this is the way things are and then we look at that and then generalize things from there and so the the view though it it leads to kind of a scientific nihilism because and again if, if it's if you don't understand the view it's kind of hard to understand why this is the case but essentially what you're saying is a law of nature on this view for example is nothing more than just the way things have happened to go up until this point hmm. right because you've just observed the way things are or way things have been and since since on this view there's nothing that necessitates those things like interacting in the way that they do right so if we say for example on the powerist view that that uh, uh, fire melts ice, right? Fire has the power to melt ice. Well, whenever fire is around ice in those particular conditions, it must melt ice like that. We know that that's the case. There's like a necessary connection there because of the powers they have. Well, yeah. on the neo humanist view, it just is the case that fire has always melted ice. And so because of that, we can generalize, well, it's probably gonna do that in the future. But it might um, not. But there's nothing that necessitates it doing that. Wow. And so it makes induction, right? That type of reasoning, like looking at what's happened in the past and reasoning forward from that, kind of like impossible. Like you can't, like it, it's hard to make sense of on that view. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's kind of like the, the problem. But again, like the advantage is that it's very simple. It doesn't say that there's any of these necessary connections amongst things. And so as my professor pointed out he's like you'll find that there are usually you take like you and what i appreciate about this class is you kind of saw how each particular view you take kind of builds and builds upon each other and you're like oh i'm taking this view because i thought of this view as like being the most reasonable and like this makes the best sense of this mm. and so we're going to get a little bit later on when we talk about possible worlds as like david lewis who is kind of like the archetypal neo humian um example as being like he's got a view on that that he's just like all right give me this view and like all of your metaphysical dreams will come true and we can make sense of the world the trouble is it just the view he takes it just feels very like not the way that like it's not intuitive at all and it, huh. it leads to some bizarre conclusions and we'll talk more about those and so again that's not to denigrate david lewis he's brilliant but um he was i should say he's dead now right. but um uh it's just a very i don't know it to me it's a bizarre view um and again if you don't understand it that's fine like it takes a, a while to kind of wrap your head around it so i guess to so, summarize uh okay. go ahead well i was just gonna ask you as a molinist what view do you find preferable I probably lean towards powerism, really? which again, surprised my professor does as well. Um, you I you think, said your professor does? Yeah. Now, Pickavance isn't a Molinist, is he? No, I don't believe so. Yeah, but he is a libertarian. I think so. Yeah, I, I, um, I quoted him in my book. He uh, seemed to give a... Um, well, 
he and JP Moreland have uh, done a lot of work together, yeah. not necessarily on like the philosophy of mind stuff. I don't think, but um, uh, it would, it would make sense if JP Moreland has influenced his thinking yeah, on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, I don't want to, I don't want to speak for him, but I, I would believe he yeah. is. I don't know. Um, yeah. I gave a great block quote uh, from his metaphysics book mm -hmm. um, that he wrote with uh, Coons. I yeah. Believe. Coons. Yeah. That was our textbook actually. Oh yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, it seemed to me that he, uh, affirmed libertarian freedom. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, yeah. don't want to Maybe put words in his mouth for sure. But yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll ask him about that. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so I would probably lean towards powerism. And again, like part of that probably is because I was taught by one, but also I just think it's the most natural way to understand the way mm. things are. <laughs> um, uh, and like, I, I find the problems that they have at their view less serious than others. Um, which, you know, again, that's, it's kind of how you assess views. You're just like, all right, which one of these doesn't yeah. suck as much as <laughs> that's the other? right. They're all bad. What's the best of the bad? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so I'd probably lean towards, uh, powerism. So, you know, just to summarize kind of what I talked about there, the, in, you can understand these views in terms of again like what what they consider the most fundamental aspects of reality right so uh each view we talked about takes a different one so the hypotheticalist says okay all cause and effect that's just reducible and when i say reducible it's just like equal to um in in other words counterfactual conditionals so like if the rock hit the vase the vase would break that's what mm -hmm. fragility is right the gnomus says that all cause and effect is reducible to laws of nature, right? So the laws of nature are just like, hey, vases break when they're hit with rocks. Like, that's just the way things are. Um, and then from there, you can build on other things. And then the powerist says, no, no, no. All cause and effect is just these powers that things possess and the way that those interplay with each other. And then finally, the neo humius says, no, nope, it's this categorical state of the world. That's the most fundamental thing in our perceptions of cause and effect. That's what we discover from examining the categorical state of the world. And so that kind of so each one of them is just going to put whatever they however, they're going to structure it a little bit uh, differently than others. Interesting. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move uh, move on from cause and effect here. Um. I remember you telling me uh, about your paper uh, this past semester. And in fact, you let me proof it. Um, mm -hmm. I tried to get through it. It was a <laughs> great paper, but it wasn't it was that bad. No, no, it was a really good paper, but it was blowing my mind. I mean, you were getting into things that uh, I haven't really studied, at least yeah. in, in, in that depth that you were going well, into. So that's why it's so important to have a a team, you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so we can all kind of focus on, there's mm -hmm. a lot of overlap, but then, uh, unless you're Dr. Craig and can be a, an expert on everything. Well, and um, he's uh, <laughs> done it for, you know, yeah. 40, mm -hmm. 45 years or whatever yeah. it is. Um, yeah. so that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just blows my mind how he can be so knowledgeable about so many things, but uh, most people can't do that. But, um, and I guess I'll just say one more thing. It's important to recognize your field and where you're out of your depth. Yeah. Because I, I can definitely attest to this temptation to want to have an opinion on everything. Right. You know what? In my personal life, I'm going to do that. But when you're speaking or writing on something and you're like, Hey, like I've studied, like I know the correct, I know the literature. I, I feel like confident, like maybe I'm wrong, but like I can put together a well-informed opinion. Right. Um, speaking in that sense of authority that doesn't mean you can't like pontificate on right different topics but it's like okay if i'm going to speak as an authority on this i need to have done my research right 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 yeah and that you know as uh that can be dangerous um for for the uh apologist or you know a guy like me yeah. who blogs a lot you know i'll, I'll look in, into different areas uh, get a little bit of information on stuff and then mm -hmm. write about it, offer opinions. But definitely there's some things that I write about that I'm not an expert in, yeah. uh, but I probably know a little bit more than the average person that right. maybe I can introduce people to it. Then there's things that I have devoted my life to studying mm -hmm. and feel I can have that conversation with anybody, yeah. but and, it's, uh, and you can, yeah. and you can have like opinions on things that you haven't studied in depth for right. sure. It's just like, how tightly are you going to hold and how authoritatively are you going to speak on it? 
Yeah. That's really the question. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to the end times, you know, eschatology, yeah. for, for example, I've definitely got my opinions, but you know what? I have studied it. I've spent, mm-hmm. uh, I've spent some time. So I've had a class on it mm-hmm. when I was <laughs> going to school. Um, but I definitely don't feel like an authority there, mm-hmm. but I will give uh, my, my opinions on it. Um, yeah. but it's not like, uh, you know, when I, when I, you know, studying Molinism, I, I know much more about Molinism than I right. do about eschatology. Yeah. <laughs> so, You're well acquainted with the literature. Under right. Those, right. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. All right. So let me get back to this question for you. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So that paper, uh, that you wrote, uh, that I was trying to get through, <laughs> uh, um, it was about realism of properties. Mm-hmm. So can you talk just a little bit uh, about what the, the question you were trying to answer was and how it's relevant to what you and I have talked about so far? Yeah. Um, so unfortunately for me, my like the part that just grabbed me in metaphysics is just like not that interesting. It's it's very interesting to philosophers, but like the amount of mm-hmm. philosophers I know, like I that's not not many. So when I talk to people about it, they're like, okay, that's, that's yeah. cool, I guess. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, I just find this question fascinating because it it's, it's really about uh, what makes things the way they are. Mm. Right. So a big debate in metaphysics is between the realists and the nominalists. Right. So if you think about the way things are in the world, like they each have a way that they are right so the, so tim you exist but also you have a way that you exist right for example you are bald right so you know if, if, if all i said was tim exists you're a thing in this world and that doesn't really tell us anything about the way you are right other than your name right like mm-hmm. there's nothing really describing you so if i say you're bald then a it seems to me that i'm attributing to you some sort of uh, property right? In this instance, it's uh, baldness, right? So yeah. the question then is, is there one thing that exists called baldness that you share in common, excuse me, with all other bald people, right? Do you something, all share baldness? Something that actually exists. Yes, correct. Okay. okay. Um, however you want to define that type of, <laughs> which is a different question, but mm-hmm. exists in the sense that, yeah, it's, it's just as real as like you and I are. Um, but maybe it, it, it would definitely, it would certainly exist in a different kind of way, but um, it is a real thing that, that we would say is like, if we were counting up everything that exists, this would count. Um, so the realist answers, yes, there is a thing that exists called baldness. In particular, there's one thing that exists called baldness that's universal and shared by all bald things. Okay. Right. So um, that's the realist answer. And the nominalist would say, no, there isn't one bald thing. Now, uh, uh, um, uh, yes. So that's kind of like the difference there. So when we talk about properties, properties are those things that ground the character of things as well as the uh, similarity of those things with uh, with other things. So, Tim, according to the realist, you are similar to other bald people in that you all share the same property, you know, baldness, right? Mm-hmm. That that's what that's what makes you similar to them. Whereas the nominalist says wait, hang on, we don't need to say that there are things like baldness that exist to ground your baldness or to say that your baldness is similar to someone else's, right? Now, to be clear, nominalists don't necessarily deny the existence of these properties. Some some of them do, right? So, So they could say that they exist, but rather they would just deny that their role is to ground the character and similarity of objects that exist. Right. So, so explain, explain to our readers what a nominalist is versus a realist. Yeah. So nominalists say, so, so let's take our example, baldness, right? Mm-hmm. So you're bald. The realist, the realist story is Tim, you are bald because you exemplify this universal baldness. Let's say I am also bald, for example, or let's let's say Michael Jordan, um, because he actually is. Michael Jordan is bald. So you and Michael Jordan are similar in that you both share your exemplification of baldness, right? So there's this one thing. So you are similar to Michael Jordan. Sweet. Uh, (laughs) And so uh, the nominalist says, no, that's not how we understand similarity. So 
they would say some some nominalists say no there are no such things as universals um in fact that's probably more common but uh they they could say okay there are new universals but their role is not grounding that character in similarity they would just say that we do that in other ways we don't need to posit the existence of these things right so that's kind of the difference between the realist and the nominalist does that make sense yeah i'm uh you know a little bit aware of this when i first started attending biola in 2011 i think uh i was first introduced to this i mean just right out of the gate mm -hmm. um and uh and I've been struggling with it ever since, um, you know, and, and what I find interesting is, you know, J.P. Moreland and Dr. Craig wrote Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview Together. And that mm -hmm. book is like, you know, this thick. And they basically agree on everything across the board, except for this issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I vacillated back and forth. Um, and so I'm interested to see where you're going to land on this. Yeah, yeah. Um... That was uh that is interesting and uh, I think so you know what I'll, I'll save my view until I finish articulating everything. <laughs> okay. And then, okay. Uh, this is and so pretty much way what to, we're going to about, keep the viewer engaged. They're exactly, not going anywhere. That's exactly right. what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> because most of these things, like I I have positions on them. I I'm not just this is probably the one I feel the most strongly about. And okay. just I mean because it's also the one I've research the most so yeah again could be wrong but i just feel like yeah this is this just really seems um likely to me that um uh my position is what it is mm -hmm. which uh we will talk about in a little bit but let's let's uh let's talk about the nominalist view because oh, yeah. there are kind of more flavors of nominalism like realism is pretty standard in how you understand that particular how like so how properties play the role or realism is pretty like straightforward because you're just saying these universals exist in ground character and similarity. Like that's pretty straightforward. There are other questions within that, which we'll get into in terms of like, okay, what does exemplification mean? Like, how does that relationship work? But um, from that perspective, from what we're talking about just now, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the uh, nominalist though, has a number of different options because you have to remember there's still this question how do we ground character and similarity of things right so mm -hmm. what i mean by that is what makes something the way it is on nominalism if there aren't properties what makes two things similar to each other if there aren't properties that they're sharing like how to how to okay. nominalists uh you know account for this because that seems to be a pretty important thing to truth maker discussion we've got our saying side we're saying Tim and Michael Jordan are similar in that they're both bald, right? So that's our saying. Now, what is it on the world side that that corresponds to, right? So we have to understand what that is. So it seems to me realists have a pretty straightforward way of understanding it. Nominalists, they have more work cut out for them. Hmm. So we'll outline a couple of options. So yeah. first one is class nominalism. So class nominalism, they try to ground similarity and character in the classes of things, right? So we could say that bald people are similar to one another in that they each belong to the same class of bald things. So you and Michael Jordan and, uh, you know, Joe Schmo on the street are all bald, share the same class, right? To uh, And that's, that's how you're similar. And because um, you are part of the bald class, that's what grounds the character of, of you. So it's not that there's a thing, there's like a, a, a property that exists. It's just that you're all grouped together, classified together. So that's class nominalism. The next one is resemblance nominalism. So resemblance nominalism says that similarity and character are grounded in the resemblances between objects. So basically there are these fundamental resemblance relations between objects. And so in virtue of this resemblance, they are similar, okay? So objects that resemble each other are part of the same classes, but the class is not the thing that grounds the character. It's the resemblance relation. So it's kind of similar to class nominalism, but it's, it's more that just there's this fundamental resemblance between you and other bald people that, that exists. And that's kind of what, what the, uh, the resemblance nominalist says. 
Then our next one is ostrich nominalism. Now, this is kind of a funny, funny uh, worldview, um, or just kind of a, a name for a worldview. Ostrich. Ostrich. Like yep, the bird. Like, like the bird. It's basically the idea, you know what I was saying? How like there's the saying side of this and then the world side of this. They're saying like, we don't need to ground this at all. Like mm. who cares? They're just fundamental facts of the world. So you are similar to Michael Jordan because you are. Um, mm. And the advantage here, again, is that there aren't anything, There's they're not saying anything else exists other than the two particulars, right? So you and Michael Jordan are the only things that exist in this particular example um, and so that's, so the reason it's called ostrich nominalism is basically it's, I'm going to stick my head in the sand and not worry about this problem. That's actually how it got its name. Uh, that's um, funny. So would they say it's a simpler view and so it ought to be preferred? Yeah. So they're saying like, mm. Hey, we don't even need to ground this character in similarity. Mm. Um, it's just a fundamental fact. And because we're saying there are fewer things that exist, uh, realism is not to be preferred, even though it's like. Yeah, so, so that's kind of like their their view. Uh, let me let me jump in here with sure. your ball. Do you know what view of nominalism Dr. Craig would hold? I don't. I <laughs> I haven't researched his view yet. Um, okay. Really, uh, and I think he because I don't know. I haven't heard him talk much about properties necessarily. He's done more with like numbers and other stuff like that, which are at different types of abstract objects. Um, but here, even here, it's like the abstract concrete debate isn't necessarily like what exactly an abstract is versus concrete. That's not okay. entirely. It, I mean, it's it's germane to the topic, but it's not like the most interesting question that people All have, right. I suppose, um, about it. We'll so, it. Yeah, I'm not sure what he would he would take. Um, uh, he might be an ostrich anomalous. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, the the fi the fourth view we'll talk about is trope theory so trope theory is basically realism except instead of the properties of these things being universals right um which is like baldness is just like there's one baldness they're particulars so universals and particulars so particulars are like the individual objects so you're a particular michael jordan's a particular i'm a particular like there's this like individualized uh things that exist whereas baldness is a universal in the sense that there's not multiple baldnesses there's just the one well on trope theory they're saying no there is multiple baldnesses you have a baldness michael jordan has a baldness mm. uh in yeah and so on okay and so uh you know the story is in, in these these particular uh, particularized universals i suppose or properties they're called tropes so you possess a baldness trope michael jordan possesses a baldness trope right and so because and the way they ground this character in similarity is that both tr that your tropes resemble each other like like uh resemblance nominalism right so in the sense that you two resembled each other on resemblance nominalism. There's some resemblance relation. Instead of you two doing it, it's your tropes that do it. So that's trope theory. And there's a couple of different versions of trope theory that we can get into um, maybe a little bit later. But uh, uh, I don't find any of these particularly convincing. And I just, I can't get over the fact that it seems to me that something needs to be explained in terms of how things are the way that they are, right? So let's go through them one by one. So class nominalism has a lot of issues in dealing with contingent facts, right? So there's necessary facts and there's contingent facts. And so, Tim, I know you're familiar with this, but for our, our listeners, a contingent fact is a thing that is, but it could have been a different way. So, Tim, your baldness is a contingent fact. It's yeah. contingently true that you're bald, but you very much could have, and I'm, you probably did at one point, have a full head of hair. I did. Um, <laughs> and so that is something that's not necessary. Well, let's think about this. Let's say the class that grounds the property, it, property, I should say, the, the character being tall, right? So that could have been different than it is. Mm -hmm. Like certain people could have been tall than that aren't. And some people that are tall could have not been tall, right? And not only that, but that class changes over time, right? Let's say, uh, so Michael Jordan at one point was not part of the class of tall things, 
right? But now he is. Mm -hmm. Well, if that class changes, then it seems what happens is that being tall changes too, right? So there isn't a consistent identity of tallness across uh, time or across possible worlds, right? Because the tall, the people that are in tallness, because remember on this view, tallness just is that class of things, yeah. right? So even so, let's take another example. Let's say the class of dogs, right? So let's say Buddy and uh, Spike and uh, Rondo are Rondo. in the class of dogs, yeah. right? Well, what happens if Buddy dies? Does dogness cease to exist? Because that class is no longer what it is. And so how do we account for that type of thing? Hmm. And so because the, again, the, the, the grounding and similarity are just those classes themselves, it seems that if the members of the class has changed, well, that means that the class itself has changed. And so to me, I don't understand how that type of view can account for uh, similarity or, or character very well. Does that make sense? I'm trying to hang with you. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So that's, that's class nominalism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Resemblance. Well, okay. Well, one more thing on class nominalism. There is one thing that you could do. And this is what, and this is what I talked about earlier, what David Lewis talks about in terms yeah. of it's like, if you give me this thing, I will make all your metaphysical dreams come right. true. So David right. Lewis would be a, a nominalist. And he says, okay, if you are a concretist about possible worlds and an eternalist about time, then class nominalism works. And so a little bit of a, uh, uh, background there. So typically metaphysicians talk about um, possibility and necessity in terms of possible worlds. Tim, I, I know you're familiar, but for our audience, like uh, basically if we say it's possible that this is true, what we're saying is there's a possible world in which that thing is true. Well, there are different views on what these possible worlds are. There are um, concretists um, and ab abstractionists. So concretists say that these possible worlds exist concretely like they're just as real as our world they're just not the actual world right and so that's what a concretist is does that make sense yeah so dr craig rejects that view yes and right. i would say most christians would too mm -hmm. i gotta i think it'd be a very troubling view for most christians to hold yeah. um and then uh uh you could be a concretist or you could also be a fatalist which is just that there's only one possible world so mm -hmm. either one of those although effectively that means you are a concretist because every possible world does concretely exist except there's only one of them huh. um uh and then you also would want to be an eternalist about time so eternalism again and we're, we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail is the view that there's like it's just kind of a 4d static block yeah. of the universe that Be every theory. time yeah exists exactly just as real as every other time mm -hmm. and so if you're a concretist about possible worlds okay and an eternalist about time then class nominalism works right because those classes do not change right because there isn't any change right yeah. because the class of dogs like even if buddy dies mm. he that class right. doesn't change, right? It's just, yeah. it's a different part of the, the time block because Buddy still exists back there. So I don't have or, access to that though, since I reject. Right, theory. exactly. And I, I think both concretism and eternalism have some pretty nasty consequences on, yeah. at least in my view. And we can talk about those a little bit uh, later in a different episode. But again, so if, if that's the cost, I think, I don't think it's worth it to hold on to class nominalism. Yeah, yeah, I, I would reject uh, the B theory, that static theory of time, mm -hmm. and that these other possible worlds actually yeah. exist. So exactly. I, I don't. Yeah, that doesn't do anything for me. Yeah. So that's <laughs> that's class nominalism. I just yeah. wanted to point that out because my criticisms could be answered if you hold other views. So I didn't want to just say, okay. well, it's impossible. That's good. Um, yeah. So resemblance nominalism doesn't really make sense to me because it seems that I don't understand how to define resemblance without appealing to character, right? But yeah. if you're saying that resemblance is what grounds character, you can't say things are similar in virtue of their character. Like they don't resemble each other in virtue of their character because the character is the thing you're trying to ground. And so I don't understand how to define a resemblance relation unless you already have character. And so to me, I, I that doesn't make any sense to me um okay. so that 
that seems troublesome. Um, and then finally, ostrich nominalism as well. Uh, it, it is simpler in that it doesn't suppose as many things that exist, right? Because they'd say uh, universals don't exist. It actually is more complex than um, uh, in, in certain ways than, in, than realism, right? Mm -hmm. Because what you're saying is that these these facts about similarity and uh, uh, um, character, like each of those are grounded, like they're they're individually grounded, and so whereas like the um, there are how do I want to say this? There are more fundamental facts on an ostrich nominalist view, right? So a fundamental fact is that you are similar similar to uh, Michael Jordan, right? Mm -hmm. um, rather than you two possess a, uh, or basically whoever possesses the uh, property baldness is similar to one another, right? So in order to say that you're similar to all the bald people, there would have to be a fact between you and bald person one, you and bald person two, you and bald person three, you and bald person four, rather than just the one fact of all of them, all who is similar to this guy, um, are are similar to each other. So that's a, it's a yeah. bit of a difficult distinction. And I actually talk about this in my paper. In my mind, actually makes this a worse position in terms of its complexity, just because it posits more fundamental facts rather than whereas, but but you know, in in more fundamental types of things. So that's kind of my problem with ostrich nominalism. And then finally, uh, and again, if that doesn't make a ton of sense, that's fine. That that's a pretty technical point that it's easier to write out um and then finally uh, trope theory it appears to me pretty much it's explanatorily speaking it's just realism but it's just got it says that there are more things that exist and so it's like okay if i get everything i get with trope theory that i get with realism i may as well just be a realist all right so, so that's what you are so yes i would consider myself <laughs> a realist um, and actually what's very interesting, um, I didn't even talk about what I wrote about in my paper yet. Um, mm. and I'll, I'll do a brief thing, um, on that real quick, but I resisted it for most of the class. I was like, I don't know, like this just feels, and also I'm a contrarian. And so if my professor's teaching me realism, I kind of want to disagree, but that's like, what I loved about you <laughs> the first moment I met you. <laughs> I just want to disagree. You disagree with everything I was saying, right? <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, and so like I wrote, I started out my paper. I was like, okay, I think this is a problem for realism and I'll say what it is and I'm going to write about it. And then by the end I was like, gosh, I feel like nominalism's problems are worse though. Like, I don't think this is that bad. And honestly, like even if, even if none of the uh, solutions the realist has work, I think my like the nominalist faces these problems as well. So the problem I talked about on realism is that what makes a property different from another property? Okay. So if we say that um, you and I are different from each other in virtue of at, at least sometimes the properties that we possess, like you possess baldness, I don't, right? So that that's a way in which we're different, right? right? What makes properties different from one another, right? Well, there's a number of different ways you could understand this, and each of them has some potential issues with it. <clears throat> so I went through, I believe, three or four solutions that a realist could offer. And I'm trying to do this off the top of my head because I didn't write this part out. But um, my uh, the first one is, okay, we could say that properties are different in virtue of the properties that the properties possess, right? So yeah. properties can be a certain way, right? So um, properties can possess a uh, property or it can exemplify properties the way that particulars do, right? So for example, the property um, baldness possesses the property being a property, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, the property, uh, baldness possesses the property, um, of like, uh, not baldness is tough. <laughs> I'm trying to think of other things that it might have of, uh, I don't know. 
being possessed by humans or something like that. Like, uh, that's probably a poor example. I'm trying to off the top of my head. I think I talked about colors primarily because those are usually the most uh, paradigmatic types of examples of properties. So, for example, let's say uh, green, the color green, saying the property of being green possesses the property of being a property, possesses the property of being a color, um, and it, yeah, and and so on. So, there's a, a number of different ways the property of green is. So, you could say, okay these meta properties i suppose or these properties about properties could differentiate properties from one another well the problem is with that i don't see how i don't see what properties the, each of these properties could possess that would differentiate them from each other so for example the color properties so like blue green yellow all of those well they could differentiate each other in some aspects, but in others, they wouldn't. So they all possess the property being a color. They all possess the property being a property. Red, blue, and yellow all possess the property being a primary color, right? Well, the only thing that seems to differentiate them is the character that they're trying to ground, right? So the only thing that differentiates red from blue from yellow is red's redness, blue's blueness, yellow's yellowness. Mm -hmm. So the so since the the meta properties don't seem to work to differentiate them, you'd have to say, well, it's just the character that the properties ground that differentiates them. But that seems problematic to say that properties possess the character they ground because how can a property how can how can greenness possess like how can greenness just ground green? without also grounding being extended in space or, uh, you know, having a shape, something like that. Like, mm. it seems that in order for something to be green, it has to possess other properties, right? So there's no such thing as a simple green property, right? There seems to imply the existence of other types of, of, of other um, dimensions of character, I suppose. So Robert Garcia writes about this. He calls them like thickening principles. And so he writes against primarily trope theory for this because a version of trope theory says that these tropes possess the character that they ground. And so that seems problematic um, mm -hmm. to say that. So it seems to me that like the uh, properties that or the character that these properties have can't really separate them very well. Again, this is all kind of technical and <laughs> I'm just right. I'm just talking about it because I wrote a paper about it and I thought it was interesting. <laughs> um, and then I talked about a view called, um, uh, you know what? I'm just going to pull it up real quick because I can't remember. Oh yeah. The second one I talked about was uh, causal structuralism, the name of the view. Mm -hmm. And so causal structuralism is just the view that um, uh, basically what makes a property, the property that it is, is the causal powers that it gives to things right mm -hmm. so for example the property being green gives the causal power to my grass uh the ability to cause an observer to see green right so that's that's what a property is at its essence is a, it gives powers to, to things and so i found this to be probably the most plausible um i still had a couple of problems with it that are kind of technical um uh primarily having to do with like um let's see if i can summarize this <laughs> in um, uh, an easy way pretty much it seems to me that there are like it necessitates the existence of other properties in order to differentiate properties if and again like i'm sorry like it is a very technical thing um, and maybe we can get into it on a different episode but i'm trying to be brief um but again i think it's kind of a it's a better account than let's say the uh um uh, one by uh, their the uh, property's character. Um, a third view is to say, okay, yes, they're individuated by this co individuated just being that they're made different um, by this causal profile that they have that they give to things. But there's also another thing that individuates them. So it's like a causal profile plus an additional aspect of things. So this kind of view is called uh, quiditism. Right. So. You say, okay, there's this qualitative aspect of a property. So we've got our our uh, our dispositional aspect of the property. So if you remember from our categorical dispositional 
discussion. So the dispositional part of the property is like the, the powers it possesses. But not only that, there's also like a qualitative aspect that just individuates it. It's called a quiddity, for example. Right. So what's the definition of quiddity? So quiddity is just, uh, it, that's actually a good point. That's a good question. There's a couple of different ways you could understand them. You could say that they are what's called a haxiety of a property, which is a uh, interesting word. Basically what that means is like, okay, a haxiety is a property that is like an identity property. So for example, Tim, your haxiety is Timness, right? So it's like this, there's a, some people have posited that there are properties that are, that are like, that make you, you, right? So it's like wholly apart from anything else. It's like the person who is Tim has to exemplify Timness, and that's what a hexaity is. So you could say, oh, this property is, uh, it, it is green because it has the hexaity of greenness, right? So the problem with that, it seems to me, is that, okay, if we say that properties are individuated by their hexaities, well, those hexaities also need to be individuated from each other. And so then you're saying, well, they're individuated by their own hexaities and then they would have to be. And so it's just kind of like a, yeah. a circular loop there. That doesn't seem to work to me, I guess to sum it up, I don't think quiditism provides any advantage over just the pure causal structuralism that I was talking about. And so I would just say, if you're going to go to one of these, just go with the causal structuralist view. Um, and then finally, I was just like, okay, let's say none of those work. Um, what are we left with? Well, I was like, well, we could just say that properties are different because they are. Like they just are brutally individuated. That is just a fact that green is different than blue. And that's the end of the story. And so obviously anytime you like are saying this is just a brute fact that's not explainable in virtue of something mm -hmm. else, that can be seen as like a cost for a theory. But again, I think nominalism actually has the same problem because I don't think they can ground character similarity very well or difference mm -hmm. very well without some sort of brute facts. And it seems to me there's fewer brute facts on this type of view mm -hmm. than there is on the nominalist view. And so for that reason, I would lean towards realism on right. this and so i know probably a lot of that was kind of technical and uh i don't know <laughs> i just uh like talking about it and so i just <laughs> wanted to i just wanted to say if you want if you guys would like to read my paper i will send it your way what do you think about publishing it on uh on our website on the blog i would do that yeah cool I, i'm pretty proud of it like i think it's i think it's a good good paper did you get an um, a on it I did, did. All right. Well, that's um, impressive. Uh, so like, yeah, I, I felt at the end of it and I read, well, it's funny, actually, I read through it in prep in preparation for this and I was really nervous. I don't know about you, but do you, do you hate reading what you write? Oh yeah. I, I just was cringing. I was like, oh mm -hmm. no, this is just going to be, and I read through it and I was like, you know what? That's not bad. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy with this. Like yeah. maybe it's not all right, mm -hmm. but like. It might be wrong, but I think it's wrong in an interesting way <laughs> if it is. And I'm like, honestly, with philosophy, yeah. that's sometimes that's all you want is just yeah. if you advance discussion and if somebody proves you wrong, but it took them some thought to do it. It's like, great. It's We're all better win. for it. It's a win win. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll definitely I'll definitely uh, publish it. So it, cool. Um, yeah. So that's I think that's probably a good spot to stop. I know we've been going yeah. for quite a while. Um, but, uh, yeah. Did you have any other questions about that right now? Well, I'll just, you know, let's just end with this. I mean, uh, you are taking a, a different position than Dr. Craig on this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we're going to set up a debate between you two. That's <laughs> yeah, not I have, <laughs> I, you know, I have studied it for like eight whole months. So <laughs> I think I'm about ready. Well, no. here's the, here's the thing. I'll just, I'll add this. I mean, so you've got my mind spinning right now. I've never taken a hard position one way or the other. Uh -huh. And I have gone back and forth between the two. I haven't studied it in the depth right. that you have, right? Yeah. Um, and I always kind of thought, uh, it's really, I can see how it's related, but man, I'll yeah. let other people work on that. But I paid attention and I have switched my views back and forth. I, like I said, I've vacillated back and forth. 
Yeah. And right now, if somebody would have asked me, I would have said, yeah, I'm probably leaning towards Dr. Craig's nominalism. Yeah. But now you've rocked my world and <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I'm going to invite you to continue to change my mind. But I do want to challenge you. Yeah. Um, I want you to to read Dr. Craig's oh yeah material on that and uh, see see where you're at at the end of that. But yeah, please. I, I'm, what what I love about this is that this fascinates you, mm-hmm. um, and that you've devoted so much time to figuring this stuff out. And so I'm going to yeah. lean heavily on you here, and uh, I'm looking forward to to learning from you. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to keep uh, reading and and researching it because uh, I think it's an interesting position and. Uh, I mean, even like I know Dr. Craig's written about the theological implications. Right, right, And I think that's a very uh, worthy thing to consider. Yeah, some um, people might be listening to this whole conversation and be thinking, why does this even matter? But you you think it does matter, right? Oh, 100%. There are Mm -hmm. theological implications, Um, not only just kind of what Dr. Craig talks about, but even just in my view, it's like, okay, if what if creation is creation is not only like God making things exist, but it's also God making things the way they are. And so it's like understanding how things are the way they are is understanding Mm. how creation is. And so it's like studying the way God has made the world work together. And so to me, Mm. I think it's just fascinating. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll keep the conversation going. Sounds good. See you guys next week.